Good morning, class. It is Tuesday, April 7th. Uh, welcome to another exciting uh, class of normal distributions. Welcome to another exciting week of social distancing. I uh, hope all is well. I hope all uh, of you are healthy and doing okay, hanging in there. I'm doing my best as well. Just a reminder, at 5 p.m. today, your next lab is due, lab six. This Thursday, you have test three coming up. The test will become available around 11.30 a.m. And I'm gonna give you two hours to complete it. I know on the last presentation, it was an hour and a half, but I decided to extend a little bit of time just in case there's any technical difficulties or just to give you a little bit of extra time to think and write out your solutions. I would like you to do the best you can. Also, don't forget on Thursday night around 11.59 p.m., the two homework assignments that you currently have will also be due, homework seven and homework eight. There's no lab or homeworks assigned this week, uh, only the ones that are due today and this Thursday. So let's continue our discussion on normal distributions. This is part two. So let's review and then talk about what our goal is for this section here. So last time, remember that we were using um, our calculator to help us figure out the percentage or the amount of area in a certain region of the bell curve. It was either, remember, a region to the left of a value, to the right of a number, in between two numbers, or in the tails of the bell curve. So we were finding the area given a particular x value or z score. So now today, we're going to be looking at the reverse of that, where this time, given a particular amount of area under the bell curve, what z-score or what x-value corresponds to the given area. So it's just that in reverse. We're also going to take a look at a very famous theorem in statistics later on in the lecture. Okay, so let's take a look at how do we find the z-score that corresponds to a particular amount of area. So just like last time, we're going to use our calculator to do the work for us. Now, if you ever look in the book in this particular chapter, chapter 7, the book will actually outline at least three different ways that we can do these things to find the areas, to find the scores. I decided that the best and easiest and quickest way for us to do it was using the calculator. Um, so when you do your homework, um, if the question asks, use a table of numbers or use calculus, just ignore that. We're using the calculator to find the answers to all these problems. So no matter how the question is worded, just use your calculator every single time. So how do we find the z-score that corresponds to a particular amount of area? So on the calculator, here's the code that we need. So just like last time, you're going to hit second and vars, but this time you're going to select number three instead of number two. This is called the inverse normal. So in INV norm. So it's the inverse norm. So what we're trying to do is the reverse of what we did the last time. This time we're going to tell the calculator the area and the calculator is going to tell us the actual score. Now, there are three numbers you have to tell the calculator in your code. The first area is the, uh, sorry, the first number is the amount of area to the left of a certain position on your curve. And of course, since we're working with z-scores, remember z-scores have a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. So these are the three numbers that we need for z-scores. And this is what the code would look like. So your z-score, uh, so on your calculator, you don't have to type Z equals. You only have to type the code inverse norm, the amount of left area, comma, zero, comma, one, and it will give you the Z score. Okay? So for example, what Z score corresponds to the 80th percentile? So first you got to think of this. Okay. Um, well, I know 80th percentile means this. On the bell curve, we're going to find a particular position where 80% of the data is less than or equal to that particular number. Now, I put the dotted line here in the middle to represent, remember, z equals 0, which is the mean. So at 0, that's where 50% of the area would lie to the left. So 80% is more than that. So that 80% has to be somewhere above the middle. Okay, so think of it like that. The middle is always your 50% mark. Anything more than 50 gets moved over here somewhere. Okay. 
So here's how you do it. You tell the calculator how much area you have to the left. And in this case, that's all we have is area to the left. So it's 0.8, not 80. Make sure you use decimal value. If you type in 80, you're probably going to get uh, an error of some sort. So use decimal area, 0.8, and then 0 and 1. And here's what it spits out, rounded to 0.84. Now, what exactly does that mean, Z equals 0.84? Is that a percentage? No. It looks like a percent number. It looks like 84%, but that is not what this means. So here, let's redraw the graph a little more precisely. So on the Z axis, all right, let's put a nice scale there from negative 3 to 3. This number is a position on that axis. It's positive and it's closer to one. So that's the z-score position where that 80 percentile begins and moves to the left. All right. So it's not a percentage. It's a position on the z-axis. Now, I want to point out something on the calculator, folks. So and it all depends on what kind of calculator you have uh, and uh, what you can do with your calculator. So if we do the second vars and number three, I have 0.8 for area, mean is zero, sigma is one. Now I know some of you don't have a menu like this, and this is why I'm instructing you to use left-sided area. Because if you don't have a menu like this, your calculator will only find left-sided area. If you have this menu, you can do more than just left-sided area. You can do middle area, you can do right-sided area, all right? But for those that don't have that option, you always have to input left-sided area. So, so that we're doing the same thing with every single student, I, I wanna make sure that we're all at least entering the same thing so we get the same answer. So I'm gonna keep using left-sided area for all these problems, even if it's right-sided or middle area, okay? So when you hit enter, the code will pop up on the screen, and then there you go. 0.84 is the z-score. Okay, so now when I quit out of there, I'm just going to clear my screen. Oops, clear. And now we're going to move on to the next example. What z-score has 60% of the bell curve area to its right? So, so when you figure, okay, 60% to the right, has to include at least the right half. So I have 50% for the right half, and then probably 10% in here. So that z-score mark is gonna to be to the left of the middle. So we're gonna predict that the z-score has to be negative because it's below zero. All right, so now using our code, how much area is to the left? So if I'm only using left area in my code, 40% is to the left. So I'm gonna use 0 0.4, not 0 0.6. So left-sided area, remember that. And then, of course, 0 and 1 is the mean and standard deviation of the standard normal. All right, remember, z-scores are called standard normal. And the code gives me negative 0.25. So remember, on the bell curve, this is what it really looks like. That's not a percentage. That's just the z-score position of where that 60% area begins and goes off to the right. But you still have 40% to the left. All right, so the z-score is negative 0.25. Number three, find the z-scores that separate the middle 90% of the bell curve. So what does middle 90% look like? Looks like this. So middle means it's going to be in between two values. And because of symmetry, these two values are going to be the same, but one of them is negative. Okay? Now, if I'm using the idea of left-sided area, how much area do we have to the left of my leftmost part? So what area is this right here? All right, well, it's 5%. Why? Because if I have 90% here, then 10% remains for these two tails. And again, because of symmetry in our bell curve, that 10% can get divided up equally between the two tails that are not shaded in. So 10% divided by 2 is 5 and 5. For each. So I have 5% area to the left of this negative z-score. So I only have to use that much. And of course, 0 and 1 for the mean and standard deviation. And then just run it on the calculator, you'll get rounded uh, negative 1.96. <clears throat> 
Also, don't forget, z-scores are two decimal places, sometimes three, depending. All right, the positive z-score. How much area is to the left of my positive z? Is it 90 or is it 95? It's 95, right? So when we say area to the left, that means starting at the number and going all the way out, all the way out. So it's 90 plus 5 is 95. So you get positive 1.96. Now, because of symmetry, you don't need the code for the second part. You can just use the fact that the bell curve is symmetric, and you can reflect the negative 1.96 over to the other side and change it to positive 1.96. Okay, so that's how you find z-scores. Now, how do we find x-values? Remember, x-values are actual data, actual data based on area. So the first thing you're going to do is what we did in the first example. We're going to find its z-score using the inverse norm, left area, 0, 1. And then what we're going to do is we're going to find x using x's mean and x's standard deviation, mu and sigma. Okay? Because remember, z has a mean of 0, but x has a mean that's something else. Z has a standard deviation of 1, but X will have a standard deviation of something else. <clears throat> so we're going to use the something else values for X. So remember this formula? This is the formula that we use to calculate a Z-score given a data value X, its mean, and its standard deviation. What we're going to do is use a little bit of algebra to solve this for X. Because what are we trying to do? We're trying to find X. So what we're going to do is rewrite this formula to figure out what x is. So what would I do first to solve this for x? First thing I would do is multiply both sides by my denominator, sigma. And then what happens on the right side? The sigmas cancel out. So then that leaves me with x minus mu on one side and sigma times z on the other, or z times sigma. And then last step here to get x by itself, we're going to add mu to the other side. And therefore, our x value is simply found by multiplying z with sigma, so z times standard deviation, plus the mean. <clears throat> so for example, suppose x is normally distributed with a mean of 50 and a standard deviation of 7. Find the 38th percentile. So what that is asking me to do is find the data value that corresponds to the 38th percentile. So what data value has 38% of all the data less than or equal to that number? Okay. So now on the graph, step number one, find the z-score. So the z-score is a particular position such that 38% of the data is less than or equal to that number. So that's what percentile is, don't forget. So now how do I find this? Just what we did before. Tell the calculator your left area, and then type in 0 and 1, because z has a mean and standard deviation of 0 and 1, not 50 and 7. <clears throat> so by doing that, we get negative 0.31 for the z-score. And now the final step here is to get x by using our new formula, x equals z times sigma plus mu. So you plug in the values. There's three numbers there that you plug in. And then just crunch the numbers on your calculator. And the x value is 47.83. Now, how are we going to round this? Well, in this problem, it really doesn't matter because there's no real data. Or there's no real context in this problem. So don't worry about rounding here. But rounding will vary from problem to problem. Okay? So if your data is whole numbers, then round that to a whole number. If your data has one decimal place, round that to one decimal place. Okay, so this is an example that I already have typed out for you on your NTS. Um, this is number 48 from your textbook there. So suppose that the reading speed of sixth grade students is approximately normal, with a mean speed of 125 words per minute and a standard deviation of 24 words per minute. So right there, there's two statistics that we need, mu and sigma. 125 for mu, 24 for sigma. So now, question A. What is the reading speed of a sixth grader whose reading speed is at the 90th percentile? So I'm sure by now 
we know that 90th percentile means left side area, 90%. So now when we say what is the reading speed, that means find x. Find the data value that corresponds to that particular reading speed. So 90th percentile looks something like this, where 90% of the data is less than or equal to some value. So remember, the first step is to get the z-score, okay? So that's why I have zero in the middle, because we're still using z-scores. So the mean for z is zero. So using my inverse norm, I put in the left-sided area is 0.90 or 0.9, and then 0, 01. So the z-score for that is a 1.28. Step two, final step, we use our formula for converting z to an x value. All right, so it converts z to an x value. So you plug in your z-score, standard deviation, and mu, and then add it all together, and you get 155.72. Now, remember, the data is pretty much, for the most part, whole numbers. So we could say that um, the 9th percentile is approximately 156 words per minute. We could also say, if I asked you to summarize this in a sentence, we would say 90% of all sixth graders uh, have a reading speed that is less than or equal to 156. B, a school psychologist wants to determine reading rates for unusual students, uh, both slow and fast. So remember, unusual means those that read at a very fast rate that's very, very above average, and for those that are at uh, a, a much you know lower a slower pace of reading so determine the reading rates of the middle 95 percent of all sixth grade students so why would that be an acceptable range for um, uh, unusual values because remember in the empirical rule part two that 95 percent of the data is within two standard deviations and remember, when you go beyond two standard deviations, it's unusual. So middle 95% is a usual range. Anything outside of that would be unusual. Okay, so here's your middle 95%. That's what it looks like. And so if you look at what's in red there, that adds up to 5%. So 95 plus 5 is 100. So I took that 5% and I divided it equally into the two tails. So that's why it's two and a half and two and a half. This way, everything adds up to 100. All right, so now, to get the negative z-score, how much area is to the left of my negative z-score? Only this 2.5%. So I do inverse norm 0.025, and it gives me negative 1.96. <clears throat> Using symmetry, positive 1.96 for the positive z-score. Easy enough? Okay. So now let's get x for each z. So we have two z-scores to change to x values. So using our formula, you do z times sigma plus mu for each of those. All right, And you do get different answers because one of the numbers here is negative and the other is positive, so it's not the same answer. So we get those values there. <clears throat> so therefore, the middle 95% read between 78 and 172 words per minute. And what I didn't write here is really the, the, the better conclusion, is that anything outside of that, anything less than 78 and anything more than 172 is unusual. Okay? Okay, so now this brings us to uh, the second half of our lecture for today. Um, so now we're going to be looking at a very famous theorem in statistics. So in order to discuss and define the theorem, we need to define a sampling distribution. So let's suppose that we have a population uh, and it has a mean of mu and a standard deviation of sigma. Now notice that there's a little sub x next to each of these, mu sub x, sigma sub x. And that just means the mean of all my x's and the standard deviation of all my x's. That means the mean of my data and the standard deviation of my data. All right, and in this case, it's, a, it's population data. All right, so now let's define a sampling distribution. So the first thing is this, is that from your population, we're gonna take a sample, and the sample is gonna be of size n, like 30 people or 40 people, 
And then what we're going to do is we're going to compute the mean of that sample. And remember, the sample mean is x bar, x bar. Now remember, what we're doing is developing a theorem. So we're going to be very theoretical here for a minute. So what do you do after that? We're going to repeat the process. We're going to repeat A and B over and over and over and over from our really big population. So we're going to get one sample and compute its average. We're going to get another sample and compute its average. Another sample, compute its average. And you do that over and over and over. Okay? So that's very theoretical in, in that sense. Now, what do you do next? So the sampling distribution, here's what it is. It's the collection of each of the averages you compute from your samples. Okay? So when I do the first step, I get my, my sample and I find the mean of the first sample. The mean of the first sample is x bar 1. And then when I repeat the process, I get a second group and I get its average, which would be x bar 2. And then I sample again from a third group. I get its average, that's x bar 3, and then dot, dot, dot. So the sampling distribution is simply a collection of all the averages from each of the samples. So a sampling distribution is averages from a whole bunch of different samples. Now, what about that? What does that give us? So, of course, now we have here a data set of averages. And remember, averages are very close to the middle, which means this particular data set's not going to be very wide. All right? Regular data sets are very spread out, but a sampling distribution is going to be very narrow because averages are near the middle. So, sampling distributions now lead us to what's called the central limit theorem, a very famous theorem in statistics. So, as n approaches infinity, so that means as your samples get bigger and bigger and bigger, the shape of the sampling distribution will become normal, which means your sampling distribution is going to be bell-shaped. It will be bell-shaped. Now, what is the mean of the sampling distribution, the mean of all those x bars? So now notice here, look at the symbols. We have mu sub x bar and we have mu sub x. Mu sub x bar means the mean of the x bars. So in other words, mu sub x bar is the average of all of these. All right, mu sub x bar is the average of all the x bars. So mu sub x is the average of all x's, okay? So if your n goes to infinity, the mean of all your x bars will equal the mean of your population, okay? And that should make sense. If you have a really large population, if your groups that you collect are big enough and it covers a really good part of the population, the central limit theorem tells us that the mean of my sampling distribution should be equal to the mean of the whole population. All right, so in other words, it's the average of all the averages, and that's going to equal the population mean. All right, so the average of all the averages will give you the population mean. Standard deviation. So the standard deviation of all the x bars, so if I take all my x bars and figure out its standard deviation, it's the same thing as the standard deviation of the population itself divided by the square root of n. Okay, so in other words, the standard deviation of x bars is less than the population. So remember I told you that the uh, x bars, because they're averages, they're very close to the middle. So that standard deviation, remember that the distance, the spread, is less if all your numbers are averages. They're very close to the middle, whereas regular data is more spread out. So that's why the standard deviation of the sampling distribution is less than the population. How much less? This quantity here, sigma x divided by the square root of n. So again, sigma x bar is the standard deviation of all the x bars on the previous slide. And mu x bar is the mean of all the x bars on the previous slide. So let's summarize now what we have so far. So remember, with z-scores, z-scores are bell-shaped, so we say it's normal, with mean 0 and standard deviation 1. If you have x, x is normal with mean mu and standard deviation sigma. 
And now our new thing from the central limit theorem, part C, x bar is also normal with the same mean as x up here, but the standard deviation gets divided by the square root of n. Okay, so these, in a sense, I guess you could say are formulas for different types of problems. Okay, so let's do an example now. So let's suppose that our population mean is 80 and our standard deviation of the population is 14. And uh, because it's for a population, this is really mu x and sigma x. If each sampling distribution is size 49, find mu x bar and sigma x bar. So by definition, mu x bar is the same as mu x. So it's also 80, like this is 80. So the mean will always be the same. However, the standard deviation, all right, the standard deviation of x bar is our standard deviation of the population divided by the square root of my sample size. So 14 is sigma. N is 49, take the square root, you get 7. 7 and the 14 is 2. So the standard deviation of my x bars, it's much less than the population standard deviation, it's 2. In fact, it's 7 times less in this problem. All right, this example is also printed out for you on your NTS uh, for reading rates again. Uh, but this time we have uh, a mean of 90 words per minute and a standard deviation of 10 words per minute. <clears throat> now, because this only corresponds to a population of second grade students, that's mu x and sigma x. So how do I know it's not mu x bar or sigma x bar? I'll point that out in a minute. How do you know it's mu x and not mu x bar and sigma x and not sigma x bar? I'll point that out. Okay, so let's take a look at the difference between these two questions. So A, what is the probability that a randomly selected student will read more than 95 words per minute? And in B, what is the probability that a random sample of 12 second grade students results in a mean reading rate more than 95 words per minute? So notice that both of these contain the phrase more than 95, more than 95. But what's the difference here? In this question, we have a, a randomly selected student. It's one student, it's an individual. Whereas over here, it specifies it's not one student, it's 12 students, but also we wanna see that their mean rate is more than 95. So here's the difference. Question A, we would be using X as our focus, all right? And over here, since we're looking at a sample of 12 students and we're concerned about their mean reading rate, we're going to be measuring x bar, x bar. Because remember, x means individual, x bar means the mean of a group. Okay, so here's what we're going to be asked to find. The probability that x is more than 95 versus the probability that x bar is more than 95. So using the summary that I gave you two slides ago, remember x is normal with mu and regular sigma. So we're using 90 and 10 from uh, the problem itself. So more than 95 would be this. So if we use our x-axis, uh, we get 90 here is the middle, because that's the mean, and then 95 is the score that we're trying to measure, and shading to the right would be more than. And of course, to find a probability here, we're being asked to find the percentage of area. So now we're back to what we did last week, where now we're finding the percentage of area. So to find the percentage of area, to figure out this probability, we use normal CDF. All right, and then this area here has a left bound and right bound of 95 and positive infinity. So 95 and 1E99, and then you're using 90 and 10, for the standard deviation and mean of x. All right. Now, how come I'm not using 0 and 1 here? Because here I'm not using z scores. I don't need the z scores here. All right. So when you plug it in, you get 0 0.309 or 30.9%. B. So what's the probability that x bar is more than 95? Well, how do we measure x bars? So remember from the summary, 
X bars have a mean equal to mu, so that's 90, but the standard deviation is sigma divided by the square root of n. So here, standard deviation isn't 10, it's 10 divided by the square root of 12, because we're measuring 12 students here. So then the graph here is pretty much the same, but here we're going to label it as x bar, not x. All right, and then normal CDF, everything is the same as part A, except for the last number. So then that gives you a totally different probability, which is less than 5%. So we would say it would be unusual for the mean of 12 students, second grade, to be greater than 95 words per minute. Be very unusual. All right, so our final question here. What is the probability that the sum of the reading rates of five students is less than 400 words per minute? So we have here five students we're looking at the probability that their sum is less than 400 words per minute. So notice here, it's not one student, so it's not just a single X, uh, but also the word mean isn't used like in problem B. So what are we looking at here? So first, if you write this as a probability expression, it's a probability that the sum of the five students uh, is less than 400. So each student, of course, would be given a number, student 1, 2, 3, 4, and student 5. So you just write them out as each x value added together, all right, five of them is less than 400. Well, what do we do with that? Well, here's an idea. Why don't we divide those by 5? It's a little trick. If you divide them by 5, what are you doing? When you add up five scores and you divide by 5, what are you calculating? You're calculating an average. So as long as I do, you know, as long as I divide by five on one side and I divide by five on the other side, I can do that to this problem. I'm balancing the problem, okay? So this is an average. So I can say that's the probability that the average is less than 400 over five is 80. So I can just transform the problem a little bit by dividing by 5 to make it an average. So to find the probability that the sum of the five students' uh, reading rates is less than 400 is the equivalent of finding the probability that their average is less than 80. So what do we have here? We have an X bar type problem. X bar has a mean equal to the mean that's given, so 90, but the standard deviation is sigma over the square root of n. Here my n is 5 because it's only 5 students that we're considering. So it's 10 over the square root of 5. So then we use our normal CDF because we're trying to find probability, which is area percent. So now if I were to sketch this, all right, 90 would be in the middle as the mean. 80 is lower than it. And we're looking for the probability that this mean is less than 80. So we have our left bound at negative infinity and the right bound at 80. So here is your setup with the code, left bound, right bound, mean, and standard deviation. And then it gives you, whoop, gives you something. Let me try that again. There we go. 0 0.013, which is an unusual probability because it is less than 5%. So it's very unlikely that five student scores, when you add them up, that'll be less than 400. It's much more likely that it would be more than 400. So... Well, that con concludes today's lecture. So on Thursday, be on the lookout for test number three. It will become available at 1130. Complete the problems on loose leaf or blank paper, and then just scan your solutions and upload it into the test folder. So uh, if you have any questions, you can email me. We can uh, uh, discuss anything that needs discussion. Uh, but make sure you've completed your lab by 5 o'clock today and also your two homeworks by midnight on Thursday. And Thursday you have about two hours to complete your test. And then you'll be free for the weekend. So you all have a wonderful day and stay healthy. Bye now.